Right, good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Wayne McIntosh. Uh, I work for the OER Foundation, which is an independent nonprofit entity that provides uh, support and networking to education institutions around the world to achieve their strategic objectives through the use of open educational resources. And uh, on behalf of the OER Foundation, I extend a very, very warm welcome to uh, Toronto uh, for our sixth international partners meeting. Uh, it, you know, it's hard to believe that we are now at our sixth meeting. But without further ado, I would like to introduce you. I'm, I'm sure many of you know David, but uh, Dr. David Porter, who is Chief Executive Officer of eCampus Ontario. Um, Dave, David is also a member of the Board of Directors of the OER Foundation, and he will be chairing uh, the meeting. So, David, I'd like to welcome you to the podium. And let's hand over the microphone. Thank you. If you could put up that slide. Yep. So, the mic is for the benefit of the... Uh, people on the web stream, not the people in the room. We're not being amplified or broadcast within the room. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to Toronto. Uh, I know quite a few of you have flown a, a distance from way down under in Australia and New Zealand and uh, from parts of Europe as well and uh, from Western Canada and from the United States. So I think that's fantastic. The OERU is a really interesting group because it has been in existence for about seven years, and we're only now approaching the first offering of courses through the OERU in a way that will provide access for students uh, across the globe to a free and very inclusive form of education. But before I begin, I wanna just take this uh, time to acknowledge the land on which this event is taking place. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I'll be chairing the meeting today, and we'll be going through the agenda with you shortly. Uh, when I say chair, if any of you have been to an OERU meeting in the past, it really means that I'm here to make sure things are on time, but Wayne pretty much runs the whole meeting, and he makes sure that we are all on task throughout. And I see smiles around the room because people have been in this group in the past and understand what I'm saying. Uh, but before we go any further, I'd like to introduce Dr. Elaine Lamb from uh, Ryerson University, the Chang School of Continuing Education, who would like to provide a welcome to you from the institution. Elaine, I'm going to give you the mic. And if you want, you can clip it on or you can just hold it. Okay, great. That's good. There you go. Step into the camera range. Thank you for the kind introduction, David. Unfortunately, Dr. Marie Bucciani, Dean of the Chang School, could not be here with us today on account of a family emergency. She sends her regrets and wishes everyone a prosperous meeting. On behalf of the G. Raymond Chang School of Continuing Education at Ryerson University, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone here this morning. I speak on behalf of Dr. Butriani when I say that we are deeply honored to host this very important meeting. I would like to extend a special welcome to the members of the OER Foundation, Vice Chancellors, and Senior Leaders from OERU Partner Institutions. Also here with us today are OERU Partner Representations from five regions of the world, including Africa, Europe, North America, Middle East, and Oceania. And I would like to acknowledge the virtual participants attending this meeting via web stream. Ryerson University is inspired and committed from, by the concept of open education for decades. At the Chang School, it is our privilege and responsibility to carry on this legacy. Joining OERU is a critical component of this responsibility. Our participation, in this initiative creates tremendous potential to evolve the work of our faculty and learners 
and in doing so, share our insights and resources with the global community. As we are well aware, evidence shows that over the past decade, open education resources have gained incre increasing credibility and in turn, growing attention from decision makers in higher education and around the world. Closer to home, increased capacity for open resources creation and adoption has become a key priority for Ontario, with the province providing successive rounds of funding to support open resource production. Ryerson University is proud to have participated in a number of these funded projects. It is our distinct pleasure, as well as our responsibility, to give learners the opportunity to enrich their knowledge and expertise through OERs. In closing, I would like to once again thank you for being here. I hope you have an engaging and productive meeting. Thanks so much for working. Thanks so much, Elaine. Um, Ryerson has a reputation for being a very uh, innovative and fast-moving organization, and our colleagues here from the Chang School, Naza Dafarova and Lenora Zeffi are part of that team as well. We are uh, very pleased to be here at Ryerson this morning, right in the downtown core in Toronto, to give you a sense of what an urban educational environment looks like uh, you just have to walk through the streets uh, around here and get a, a full education, not only from uh, the institutions, but for what's happening on the streets as well. Right now, I'd like to just talk about the purpose of the meeting. These meetings occur on an annual basis, typically coincidentally with the ICDE conference, which is in town next week uh, and will be at the Sheraton. And so we're co-hosting through eCampus Ontario and Contact North. Uh, eCampus Ontario is hosting this meeting uh, over the next two days uh, in the facilities provided by Ryerson and Contact North will be hosting the CEO's meeting which occurs on Monday, October 16. What we generally do is take a look at the progress that we have made. Many of the people in the room are partners and have been part of OER OERU from the beginning. Others in the room today are observers from Ontario institutions or members of our own staff at eCampus Ontario. And shortly, Wayne's going to give you a chance to introduce yourselves and say a few words, and that'll be a good time for people to introduce themselves as either a, a member or as an observer today, so you can get a sense that people are here as partners and others considering becoming partners. One of the things that we always do is review the progress and implementation of the OERU strategic plan, particularly as it approaches the offering of the first year of study. And also to plan for that implementation in a very organized and systematic way, generally talking about things like uh, marketing and communications and all of the technical pieces that have to be in place when you do something of this nature. We also want to talk about refining the process evaluation plan for OERU and consult on the development of the OERU strategic plan for 2018 to 2020. And as a part of that process in breakout groups that will occur over today and uh, tomorrow, determine the operational priorities for 2018. So that's kind of the high-level aim of the meeting. Um, one of the other things that's important to know is that everything that happens in the OERU happens publicly and transparently. All of the meeting notes, agendas, discussion, uh, everything that happens in the body of the whole is made public and openly available. And so this isn't really a conference, it's more like a planning meeting, and a meeting in which we together begin to frame the future for OERU. Wayne characterizes it as a strategic planning sprint, and it's aimed at producing outcomes, actual things that we will do and commit to over the next year. And in that sense, it is an evergreen strategic planning process. What happens at OERU meetings happen with a year viewpoint, thinking about where we're going next and what we're going to do 
and being accountable for all the steps we commit to. And so we'll be building on the OERU decisions and the work done to date, the inputs from the 2017 annual report, and in examining them in the context of the OERU strategic plan, which has just ended for 2015-2017. One of the things that is a foundational tenet of OERU is that the partners have full decision-making authority autonomously regarding the agenda and any implementation decisions that occur. You can either opt in or not, but you have to at least be a part of the process and be committed to the action that you decide to take on. We are getting close to launching the OERU first year of studies. And we need to identify some strategic issues for the medium and the long term. And one of the things we really try to avoid at OERU meetings is to try, is to, try to solve too many problems at once. So the idea is to really focus on a small set of problems, come up with some recommended solutions, and then act on those. We also try to keep the presentations and monologues like this one this morning and also from the group to a minimum and really try to get into a discussion mode and small group work group sessions. This is a working meeting and so it is a real opportunity to hear from everyone present, to think about the ideas that are presented, to offer critique and feedback and work towards a plan of action that we believe will move the organization forward. One of the things that many of the people in the room will need this morning is a briefing that Wayne will provide on the history of OERU, where we have come from, why we are doing what we do, and what's in it for institutions or system agencies like my own. What are the opportunities, the key learnings for staff, the opportunity to break through on new ideas about openness and social inclusion? And that's really what we're trying to get at through the OERU process. So I think I'm ahead of schedule, Wayne. Brilliant. But I'm going to stop here and we'll let you take it on from this point. Okay? That's yours. Yeah, right, so we at we at the point of the meeting now. We, there is a permanent back channel. So folk uh, that are attending virtually uh, are most likely going to post uh, via the online commenting system. If you're logged into the website, you can do that as well. If, you, if, if you're not uh, a Twitterati, uh, you can log into this site and actually then just comment and, 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 and engage in that discussion. And for the benefit of the virtual participants, we do show the feed live. Uh, as much as possible when uh, we've got the screen, uh, the screen real estate, so to speak. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, th if you are a Twitterati, you can tweet, and the hashtag we're using is OERU17, hashtag OERU, hashtag OERU17, sorry, not 2017. OERU17 is the hashtag. And in most cases, it will harvest, but Twitter has got an, an interesting way in which they uh, display their feeds and make them available for harvesting. So in some cases, it might not appear in the feed. And I'm not going to go into that technical detail now. So this is the point of the meeting where we do the personal introductions. And it's normally the two-breath rule. You know, hi, my name is Wayne McIntosh. <gasps> And I'd like the OER to do the OERU to do the following. However, given you know David's brilliant opening and staying well ahead of schedule, you could take a little more time uh, in the introductions because we have a little bit of time in the agenda. So what we'll do is we'll uh, go from table to table. If you just please introduce yourself, um, you know, and 
perhaps share a comment about OERU, you know, what you perhaps would like to get out of this meeting, what you've gained from OERU, or anything uh, related to you know, the work that we are aiming to, uh, aiming to achieve. And what I'll also do is I'll hand the microphone around, um, and this is for the benefit of our virtual participants. This is the audio feed for our virtual participants. But before I move on, I do want to make two very significant and important announcements. And that is, you, you most probably have picked up um, and welcoming two new members to the OERU family. Uh, the first is the Chang School of Continuing Education here at Ryerson University, who has recently joined us. And we're very proud to have our first teaching institution from Ont Ontario in the network. So a very warm welcome on, on joining the family. And I would also like to uh, announce, uh, and we're very excited about this as well, the Sailor Academy uh, has just announced that they are joining our network as well. I mean, Sailor has been a pioneer uh, in the assembly of open online courses, and we all know this. And in fact, a number of the OERU courses uh, are remixes of Sailor courses because of the very fact that Sailor shared openly and freely. And I think there are very significant opportunities for our partnership, ha having a strong synergistic relationship in providing additional pathways of, uh, for, for formal academic credit for Sailor courses. So again, a, a very, very warm welcome to the Sailor Academy. It's wonderful to have you on board. So let's move on then with the introductions and I will start with my colleague from British Columbia, Gail. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm Gail from Gail Morong from Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, British Columbia. And I am very excited that we're getting very close to launching that first year. I've been with uh, OERU for about four or five years and I've been waiting for the day for that launch. So getting closer and I'm starting to have this big broad smile. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Lindsay Norris. I'm also from Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia. I work in marketing, so this is my first time being involved in a partners meeting, but I've been involved with OERU since its launch on the periphery, so I'm really excited to be here to learn a little bit more. And I'm pretty excited to be more involved as we get ready to launch the first year. Thanks, Lindsay. My name is Val Peachy, and I'm with uh, Charles Sturt University in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, Australia. And the oh, I've been involved in the OERU when I was at Thompson Rivers before. But um, the OERU is part of a critical pathway for the open strategy at CSU. So I'm delighted to be here to represent Charles Sturt. Hi, I'm Matt Dick, and surprise, I'm from TRU as well. <laughs> uh, and this is my first OERU meeting. I'm just, I think I'm most excited to get to know everyone here. So. Hi, uh, I'm Nick Baker. I'm, this is also my first uh, OERU meeting. Uh, I'm the Director of Open Learning at University of Windsor. And I think what I'm most excited about or interested in is finding ways to convince my institution that this is something we should be involved in. Good morning, I'm Peggy French from eCampus Ontario currently, but my background, I'm gonna take another half breath. My background is from the community colleges where I've worked at an access community college, so anything that boosts opportunities for students to get into post-secondary, that's what I'm here for. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elaine Lam. I have the great pleasure of being at the Chang School of Continuing Education. I have a great interest in OER. Um, I did my PhD on small states and the issues they had with accessing education uh, due to the heavy overhead costs. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. James Galapa Grossklag. Uh, I'm with College of the Canyons, a community college in sunny Southern California. Uh, my day job there is as Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources, and Dis Distance Learning. Uh, I'm also a co-coordinator of a statewide zero textbook cost uh, degree 
uh, project in the California Community Colleges. Um, also a proud board member of the Open Education Consortium, and if you're not a member, I encourage you to become a member. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, my observation on OERU is uh, being a bit starstruck here. I remember giving a talk on the future of education about five years ago, and the whole focal point of my presentation was getting to OERU, and that, that's the future of education. So I'm uh, tickled to be here as, a, an, as an observer. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Connor. I'm with Sailor Academy. I do marketing and communications there most recently, uh, but I've been with them since uh, 2010. So I've worn a few different hats, including OER research. So Sailor Academy is where I learned about OER and Creative Commons and fell in love with it. This is my first meeting, and mostly I'm excited to observe, listen, and meet as many people as I can. Thanks. Uh, Rory McGrail, I'm at Athabasca University, Canada's Open University. <laughs> and uh, I'm also I'm on the board of the OERU, and uh, I'm also a uh, a research fellow for Contact North. So I have a few hats. Oh, and I'm also on the advisory board of Sailor. So. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is Canada's other uh, open university, Thompson Rivers <laughs> University. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Erwin DeVries, the interim AVP for open learning uh, and good friends with our neighbors from Alberta, just in case you were wondering. Uh, been involved in this from the very start. Gail and I worked together many late nights and weekends by email and sharing, building up courses hacking through wiki educator markup and text editing and stuff like that. Uh, and one of our first courses was a course that came from the Sailor um, uh, listing of courses. Another one was one of our own. So there's some interesting synergies sort of coming together here, which is, which is actually pretty neat. And uh, we're pretty much at a stage now we're transitioning from uh, developing and engineering and building to starting to get to the point where uh, of implementation with some very good synergies with our colleagues at the university uh, from OERU and uh, also internally our students uh, because they have an open textbook initiative we're folding that in with this project with BC campus we have a, a Z cred uh, certificate that we're working on or Z cred that's uh, well we could toss a coin on that one uh, so lots of synergies happening and for those of you who are thinking about joining getting involved uh, it's a great way to um, really push the issues of openness from multiple dimensions into your organization and I will leave it at that <laughs> got trapped <laughs> Hello, my name is Naza Jafarova. I'm Director of Digital Education Strategies. Uh, and uh, probably m most of you know us. Uh, if you don't know, we have uh, 17 years. We're developing online courses and programs. Um, we have around 20,000 enrollments, online enrollments per year. Um, so with this amount of courses, we always looked at open educational resources. And... Um, very, very proud uh, joining the team. And I think that uh, this will allow us to re revolutionize our way, our approach for development online courses. And uh, we are looking for your support. And uh, this year we have uh, we listed a lot of objectives for this year, uh, developing online courses, working with eCampus, David Porter, um, uh, to promote um, uh, through instructional designers, developers, and faculty members, providing them training, uh, looking into business model, uh, sustainability, using o open educational resources um, in digital education strategies. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it's not easy. Hi, Joanne Saunders. I'm the executive director of marketing and recruitment for Kwantlen. Polytechnic University in Surrey, BC. This is my first meeting with OER. I'm uh, really uh, excited to get to know everyone in the room here and hearing some of your uh, thoughts and ideas um, and um, where um, the last few years um, have been for you in this group. Um, I am 
part of the marketing uh, group with some colleagues uh, from around the tables here. We will be meeting in the next two days um, to put together a formalized marketing plan for OERU. So that's my main reason for being here and I'm pretty excited to be able to work on that. Good morning, everyone. If anyone's counting, I'm now the fifth member from TRU. <laughs> um, and we have a lot of colleagues at home also on our team. So I guess this should be a little bit of a show of strength to show you that we're very seriously embedded in this project. Um, my first meeting was last year in Scotland, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I'm looking forward to meeting some new people at the table this year. And we're very excited to see this come to fruition and to see our uh, the consortium of courses launched and to get things going. Um, we have a lot of work still on the back end at home to work on, but nothing that's uh, um, nothing that we can't uh, get get through. So we're very excited. Oh, my role at TRU is I'm an associate dean in the faculty of arts. Oh. I thought I said <laughs> that's in Brenda, Brenda Thompson, <laughs> Thompson Rivers University. So it's easy to remember. <laughs> Morning, everyone. My name's Claire Good. I'm a senior online learning designer at Otago Polytechnic in Dunedin, in New Zealand. Um, so Otago Poly is is a partner institution. Uh, I've been there for about 18 months now. Um, very soon after joining, I did a course through OERU uh, as a learner. Um, and then late last year, involved in designing another course um, with a group of my colleagues and, and with Wayne. Um, my first uh, OERU meeting. I um, feel very privileged to be here and look forward to working with you. Oh, good morning, everyone. My name is David Bull. Um, I'm director of the Open Access College at the University of Southern Queensland uh, in Toowoomba, Queensland. Um, I've been um, attending these meetings for six years now, been involved since the very beginning, uh, as USQ was involved very early in OERU. Uh, I think the most pleasing thing for me is that um, over the last 12 months, OERU seem to have come a very long way um, after you know a number of years where progress was fairly slow, so that's really pleasing for me to see that we're so close now to implementing the um, minimum viable product. So it's good to be here, and hopefully we'll have some good results out of the, today's the meetings. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Adrian Stagg. Uh, I, like David, am from uh, the University of Southern Queensland, where I'm the manager of Open Educational Practice. Um, and I'm really here today to learn as much as possible over the next few days from everybody here, because uh, USQ is in a, a position at the moment where we've decided to not only invest in a role around openness, uh, but we're, we're getting uh, to the point where we should have our open strategic plan ready very soon. Uh, and some commitments to to what we are doing. Um, the only other thing which I'm going to do, as as um, because um, others have given a bit of an advertisement, so why not? Um, is that um, recently uh, you may be aware of the the DOER fellowships that were um, awarded from David Wiley's um, Open Education Group, uh, and USQ was successful in getting the only non North American fellowship. So we are very proud about that at the moment. Hi, my name is Leonora Zeffi. I'm uh, with the Chang School, manager of um, e-learning initiatives and course development. I'm very excited to be in this first meeting. And I, one thing that really impressed me and makes me um, very happy to be in this group is um, the goals and ambitions of OERU to achieve um, credit transfer amongst partner institutions. That's what our learners really need. So. Thank you. Thanks. Ah, the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I stand for this? No. Um, uh, hello, I'm Mark Singer. At, um, I'm Vice Provost at uh, Thomas Edison State University in uh, the United States. Uh, with mixed feelings, I have to say I, I, I'm no longer the only American here. I, I, uh, it's, it's complicated for me. but. Uh, um, 
Um, I, I'm really excited about seeing um, how, after the amount of work we put in over the last few years, how we're, we're looks like we're finally able to to uh, push forward with something that's offered by the OERU. That's that's not to say that we haven't benefited from the work of the OERU in the past uh, as individuals, but I'm excited to see that we're moving forward as a, as an organization uh, at this point. So. Hi, I'm Andy Brown. I'm from the University of the Highlands and Islands in Scotland. Uh, this is my second meeting. We hosted the meeting last year, so I've met uh, quite a few of you here. I'm really excited to be here today because we've got some great news, which I won't break now. <laughs> Unless... <laughs> you'll, you'll wait for the <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> That's hard to talk. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Stephanie Chu. I'm the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. I, um, I, I, this is my second meeting, and I'm quite uh, pleased that KP is actually quite involved with OER, partly because of the support from our president, Alan Davis, but also uh, we have a champion, um, many of you might know, Rajiv Jagyani. So he's actually at another OER event, so that's why he's not here today. But we're pretty close to... Um, offering an exit credential uh, in for OERU. We just need actually six more credits for English, um, which could actually occur from anywhere. So I think we can do that. And we're also, um, similar to TRU, we're also working on a Z credential in BC that's supported by BC Campus. And I have to say, I can actually say that we're the uh, top uh, adopters of OER um, open textbooks in BC. So that's partly because of the champion that we have, or various champions at KPU. Um, so we're quite involved, and I'm really pleased to see that this is growing, and I'd like to see where we could actually um, further contribute. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Good morning. Can people hear me? I've got this. Um, my name is Joan Sweeney Marsh. I'm the Director of Library and Learning Services at Sheridan College. Uh, Sheridan is known around the world as probably the best animation school, many Academy Awards. Uh, just my little plug. Um, I also uh, sit on the board for Ontario College Library Services, uh, and I come from a long history of both of public, private, and post-secondary library. So I've worked in all three sectors, which puts me in a group of about three librarians. Um, my interest is affordability, and um, high ideals are great, but I really, really want to see our students, um, especially in the community college sector, many of them first-gen uh, university or college students, I want to see our students be able to afford um, uh, education and equity on the, on the playing field. Uh, and I think having two, two daughters, one just starting med school here in Toronto, Yippie Yahoo, and one that's starting university next year, um, I, I know the stories about so many students that cannot afford to buy the materials and are often spending money on things they don't need, and it, I have a real strong ethical problem with all of this. So for me, it's all about affordability. Um, in our school this term, uh, for the first time ever, we're offering a first-year program in gerontology, a really strong social justice component with the faculty where they're using open materials, either through the university, through the library, or through open textbooks. So we're going to have our first program at Sheridan, a diploma program, and uh, our scholar and scholarly communications librarian who's joining me, she's just late coming from Hamilton, she's actively um, engaging our faculty and our community in the OER movement. So our first time here, and we're really excited to be part of this. I, I'm Valerie Lopes from Seneca College, and um, I'm going to plug that Seneca College is known for as being a transfer institution. So this whole idea of, and, and we pride ourselves in making transfers seamless, regardless of if it's within the college or to move outside. And also we have a, probably the largest international um, student population for the colleges in Ontario. So something like OER2, um, you would 
could play a very significant role in access. Uh, and so I'm here for the very first time, mostly because of David. Um, I've been working with eCampus Ontario. I'm on sabbatical. I was the director of teaching and learning, and I'm going back as a faculty member, mostly because it gives me a lot more flexibility in involving myself in projects like this. And I'm kind of adopting the digital nomad classification. Uh, so this is very important for us and for our college and our vice president. So I'm li literally here on a, um, you know, kind of let's see how it is that we could involve Seneca College with the full support of my vice president academic in some of these initiatives. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Right. So thank you very much for those introductions and, and, and keeping on uh, well on time. We are ahead of schedule, so that's good. So then I can rabbit on a little bit longer if I need to. So th thank you for that. Um, I just want to reiterate again uh, to our uh, observer institutions, you're most welcome here. Um, as, as David mentioned, one of the uh, characteristics of the OERU is our open planning model. Um, and you know, all our planning is conducted openly and transparently. And we invite anyone in the world who shares our vision of widening access to more affordable education using OER, who are interested in helping shape our futures to do so. So you're most welcome. Um, the, the other bit of inside information, which I think is quite relevant, is the fact that as a nonprofit entity, um, you know, we're in the game of making money, so we don't make money. Um, and as a, a nonprofit entity, we have no business secrets to hide. So we can speak quite candidly to any questions that you do have. And, and if during the course of this meeting, uh, you know, you have a pressing question relating to how the OERU operates or how we make money or how we don't make money or, you know, how we compete or how we don't compete. Uh, we're happy to have that discussion uh, either with me or uh, openly on the floor. So I just want to extend uh, that open uh, invitation. I think if there's one thing that characterizes OERU, it is the rigor of our planning. Uh, we, we've been doing a lot of planning for a long time. When I began this journey uh, of, you know, assembling a couple of courses using OER, I thought it would be quite trivial to sort out things like credit transfer uh, internationally. It turns out it's not that straightforward. Um, you need to do quite a bit of uh, thinking. You need to do quite a bit of talking. You need to... Uh, work openly and work transparently in order to get the systems to work. Uh, because in part, in different uh, jurisdictions, uh, in different parts of the world, credit transfer tends to work differently. And it's about figuring out how do you design a model uh, that is going to work uh, you know, across multiple countries. Um, I understand that in some countries it's uh, not that easy to transfer credit across provinces, for example. Um, but I think that's a, a, a significant advantage of this network uh, is the fact that we have spent a lot of time and energy in figuring out ways that this can work within existing institutional policies. Um, and the open you know, consultation process has helped us tremendously. I mean, going back to our input evaluation, uh, the one item in the input evaluation survey that ranked the highest of all items in the survey were the levels of trust that partners have in this OERU collaboration as a result of the open planning model. Um, and I think that is a key strength of what, what we're doing. We respect institutional autonomy, um, but agree to work together where it is to the benefit of all our institutions. So again, I want to thank you for uh, your trust in the organization and moving us forward. So what I'd like to do at this point is just go through the history. 
And what I might just do is just get myself a drink of water, if that's okay. Oh, yes, hiding in the corner. <laughs> you didn't introduce yourself, Dave. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> That's not how it works. Sorry, everyone. I'm Dave Lane. Uh, I'm a colleague of Wayne's from New Zealand, despite my American accent. Um, and uh, I'm the, uh, the guy who tries to make sure that the technical stuff all works, so I'm just busy scrambling to make sure all of this stuff is uh, going on time. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you all a bit later on about uh, the, the technology underpinnings of the, um, of the OERU and uh, how much progress we've made um, since the last time I spoke to you last year, for those of you who are in Scotland. <laughs> I'm Chris Fernlin and I work for eCampus Ontario and yeah, I'm here to make sure the AV works flawlessly. <laughs> and it is. And of course. Hi everybody, my name is Emma Gooch. I work for eCampus Ontario and I'm also here to make sure that the live streaming is going well. Thank you. And that was a timely reminder because I just uh, wanted to note um, uh, Carol Cooper-Taylor, who's introduced herself on the feed. Um, uh, Carol has been a godsend uh, in, in helping the OERU fill the gaps in the curriculum uh, to make up uh, a number of courses. And um, we were fortunate enough to have some reserves that we were able to outsource the uh, assembly of a number of courses. And so I, I, I just want to say thank you to Carol and acknowledge her work uh, and she's clearly very committed because this must be uh, quarter to, well, quarter to 10 or quarter to 11 in London. Who are the time zone fundies? But anyway, Carol, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. It's great to have you here. Right, a little history. And I should start the screen share again. Is the screen share? Oh, it is going, sorry. Great. So the OBR Foundation was established in 2009. And uh, the concept of the OBRU was in fact first conceived uh, late 2010. I had the opportunity of uh, having uh, a conversation over lunch with Emeritus Professor Jim Taylor uh, at, at a conference um, where we were thinking about, well, how, you know, how does one build a parallel learning universe uh, based oh, entirely on OER? And th those are kind of sort of the early seeds of the OERU conversation. And we uh, decided that we would call a meeting um, to discuss the OERU concept. Um, and that's how it all started. On the 23rd of February, 2011, we had the, the first meeting where the concept was proposed. And the reason I can remember the date so clearly is it was the day after the large earthquakes in Christchurch. And about half our participants who registered were unable to make it to the meeting, not because they were trapped in the earth, earthquake, but most of the flats in the South Island, because the meeting was hosted in Dunedin, were routed through um, um, Christchurch. And so attendance was lower than we expected, but we had a reasonably high participation. I think there were about 170 odd folk who signed up for the virtual side of the meeting. And um, that's where we proposed the concept. And I'm just, I'm wondering, were any of you that are present here today at that very, very first uh, meeting? Okay, but basically what happened at the meeting, we proposed the concept in terms of, you know, how, how this thing would work, and we took the bold decision of agreeing to adopt the SIP 
S uh, CIPP uh, evaluation model, which you know it's an acronym for the context input process and product evaluation model, uh, which was a structure and a framework to help us design this thing. You know, as a complex project to collect a bit of data, do a bit of research to inform the design decisions of this whole process. And we have completed the context and the input evaluation, uh, which has brought us to this very point. And uh, we are now actually going to commence, the, or we started the planning, but we will continue discussions on refining the process evaluation uh, you know, for the next stage of this process, um, when ultimately we will then do the product evaluation to see how we've done in the end. And at this point, I just, we've had virtual introductions from everyone, so I, I would like to welcome you to the meeting. And um, brief introduction, who you are. And um, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Julia. Um, I do social media for eCampus Ontario. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're most welcome. A couple of months later, in November, uh, we hosted the inaugural meeting of the OERU founding uh, anchor partners. So at the initial meeting, we had uh, three partners who had signed up to this concept. It was Otago Polytechnic, Athabasca University, and the University of Southern Queensland at the February meeting. In November of the same year, we, we, 13 partners had joined and we hosted the first, the inaugural meeting of the founding partners. So just out of interest, I wonder, because we can check, you know, so we, we'll see who, who was there and who wasn't. But just out of interest, who was at that found, found, founding meeting? David, Irwin, Rory, I think you were there as well. Rory, yeah, I was there. Mark, not that one. Oh, uh, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so at that particular meeting, the, the partners got together and agreed at that stage the inaugural credential. And our intention at that stage was to develop a Bachelor, uh, a bachelor of uh, Arts, or a Bachelor of General Studies. And, and the reason we chose that credential was because if you're trying to assemble a whole bunch of courses, pretty much any course would fit into a Bachelor of General Studies. So it was a, you know, it was a good starting point uh, to start thinking about building a, a, a curriculum. The other key decision that we took at that particular meeting was to adopt this prototyping model where we developed a number of prototype courses to help us refine the technologies and the approaches that we were using in developing and assembling these open online courses. One of the most important decisions we took, and it has served us well, and we can have Rory to thank for this, uh, was the fact that we agreed not to uh, dictate any pedagogical approach. And I think that has been a smart decision, because if you, you want to stall any project in education, have educators talking about the pedagogy we are going to adopt uh, for the OERU. Uh, but I think it's an important point because our institutions can uh, you know, implement the kinds of pedagogies that they would like to implement uh, in moving the OERU model forward. So we developed a, a couple of prototype courses. One of them was the regional relations uh, in Asia and the Pacific course where uh, Jim Taylor experimented with the pedagogy of discovery. Uh, and I, I highlight that course because it relates to some of the history as, as we move forward. We developed others. There were a couple of micro courses that we developed uh, and ran in various formats, uh, which helped inform the development of the delivery model for minimum viable product. We then held or hosted this, uh, the second meeting of OERU partners at, in Kamloops at Thompson Rivers University. It was also the uh, formal launch of the OERU. We were fortunate enough to have Sir John Daniel officiate at the event. Uh, and this is an interesting piece of the history. That is where we first 
proposed the concept of microcourses. Back at the 2013 meeting, Erwin, um, and in part I think it was really to get our heads around this challenge of the differences in course size in different parts of the world. Um, and also thinking about the possibilities of micro-credentials. So if, for those of you who, who may or may not be aware, uh, the size of courses differ in different parts of the world. So typically a three credit North American course is roughly about 120 notional learning hours. How do we calculate that? Uh, the in international standard is 1200 hours for a year of study, right? You do 10 three credit courses. So each course is roughly about 120 notional learning hours. In New Zealand, the standard course size is 150 notional learning hours. In Australia, it's tip, uh, the standard course size is 160 notional learning hours. And uh, in the UK, for example, and of course the UK is quite unique, they don't have courses, they have modules. And the modules are 200 notional learning hours on average. That, that's right, Andy, hey? Okay. So you can see that the challenge, we, we needed to start thinking about a, uh, you know, a, a currency exchange kind of model. And that was the reason for implementing microcourses. And our microcourses are uh, courses of roughly 40 notional learning hours each. So now we've established a, a kind of transfer currency that in North America, three micro OERU microcourses equals a standard three credit course. Four microcourses is good for New Zealand and Australia. Five microcourses is the equivalent of the standard module size in the UK. But that was a good step. But of course, that offered you know, us the opportunity to start thinking about micro-credentials. We also instituted at that meeting a, a, a working group organizational structure. So uh, what, we, what we do at the OERU is we establish working groups for areas of work that need to be done, like curriculum development or marketing or technology. Um, and these conveners of the working group all serve on the OERU management committee. But as the, uh, the OERU has progressed, our needs have now changed, right? And one of the tasks at this particular meeting will be to have a think about what structures are appropriate for taking us forward in the next phase of our journey. So that was the second meeting. Shortly after that meeting, we hosted the OERU Transnational Qualifications and Course Articulation Meeting at the Commonwealth of Learning. And the two uh, key decisions that came out of that meeting was that the OERU credit transfer model is largely based on, BC's, on the BCCAT system. Now, Brenda, I'm not sure what the acronym stands for. Uh, the BC, BCCAT. BC articulation and transfer? Yep, okay. A robust model which helped inform the development of our sort of articulation model. The second key as a document that was used to inform how we were developing is the transnational qualifications framework that was developed by the Commonwealth of Learning, which actually articulates these transnational problems in terms of how you get these articulations to work at an international level. And so th those are the two foundations which have been, which formed uh, or informed the development of our articulation model. We then established, or we had the inaugural meeting of the OERU Council of Chief Executive Officers, and that was hosted by Quantum Polytechnic University uh, on, in the same year. And so basically what that original meeting of the Council of CEOs did was establish the terms of reference, okay? And they also established an executive committee and which is structured from a number, or structured comprising a number of uh, deputy chairs representing each of the main regions of the OERU network. Uh, the key recommendation that came out of that meeting was to develop a strategic plan for the OERU. And there were, Erwin, I seem to, I recall there was, there was quite a lot of discussion at the partners meeting around developing a strategic plan for the OERU. Well, Creative Commons joined us. That's a bit of our own local, uh, Creative Commons New Zealand. That's a bit of our own local history. Uh, that's not that relevant to the OERU. 
the third meeting of OERU partners was hosted by the University of Tasmania in Hobart. Um, the strategic plan for 2015 to 2017 that was developed consultatively was discussed at that meeting uh, and recommended for approval to the CEO's meeting. And that is where we first tabled the draft guidelines for credit transfer. The very first draft that we developed was tabled and discussed at that meeting. Uh, and yeah, we also had a look at the design and development of the input evaluation uh, at the third partners meeting. The second meeting of the Council of CEOs uh, endorsed the strategic plan and that's the plan we've been using in moving forward with our development. Uh, at this meeting, we will be consulting on the next strategic plan for 2018 to 2020. Unfortunately, we still got till the end of the year, it's only October. Uh, so we still got lots of time to get that strategic plan done and dusted uh, before it's implemented. But this meeting will be used as a primary consultation process for the next strategic plan or the next uh, three year cycle. Uh, we also implemented a model where we uh, invited institutions on an annual basis to complete institutional action plans. And, you know, those were the years we were really trying hard to improve uh, product development. Uh, and you know, that served us well in getting to where we are today. And this is also quite significant. I mean, we, we don't have large numbers of graduates because uh, unlike certain parts of the world that like to market things aggressively before the product is available, <laughs> Uh, we took a conscious decision at the OERU that we would not market to learners until we could be guaranteed of the exit awards. So, um, but at any rate, uh, Michelle Aragon, I'm, not, I'm never sure how to pronounce that correctly, but Aragon, I believe, uh, was OERU's first graduate. Michelle took the uh, regional relations in Asia and Pacific course, right? was assessed by the University of Southern Queensland. Her credit was applied towards her local qualification at Thompson Rivers University. Now, while we don't have many, many graduates at, uh, you know, at this point in time, this demonstrated that the model works. Uh, Erwin, if you can just come up, because I won't. A minor but interesting point, it was the last course in her degree. In oh, a, wow. In an open learning degree, yes. I didn't even know that. Good bit of history. I mean, you can read. I wonder if that's a bit small to read. But there's a news announcement on the OERU site. It's, it's, it's quite compelling to read her reflections on the course. Um, you know, you can go to, it's to, to the news section of the OERU site. We also, from time to time, host regional meetings. Um, two significant re regional meetings that were held was the, uh, the OERU Oceania regional meeting, uh, where we worked with Paul Stacey, who was then at Creative Commons, in developing the OERU open business model. Okay, and I'm, I'm redistributed it again because this is quite relevant to our discussions. Uh, at the meeting, both in terms of our strategic planning, but also in terms of thinking about the benefits individual partner institutions can derive from this collaboration. Our input evaluation data is quite interesting. Uh, there are two significant clusters of partners within the network. Those partners who are engaged with OERU primarily uh, in, as, as a mechanism to uh, achieve the, uh, the community service goals. I, I was just tentative in using the, the concept of social justice. But I mean, most of our publicly funded institutions have community service goals. They see OERU as a good vehicle in achieving those community service goals. There's another cluster within the network 
that is very keen on generating new revenue streams from the OERU model by providing value-added services such as assessment, uh, pay-as-you-go tutoring options, uh, and, and, and the business model caters for that. The key message of our business model is that it is designed to serve discrete markets. And um, I'm, I'm quite frank about that. The OERU or the OER Foundation, we do not generate any revenue whatsoever from student-facing services, right? We don't generate any revenue from student-facing services. Our revenue base is membership fees. And that is by design, right? We don't want to compete with services our partners offer, right? It's not in our interests at the foundation to undermine the business models of our partners. Because if we, under, you see, if we undermine the business models of our partners, we've got no revenue stream. I'm, I'm being I'm, you know, quite candid about this. So a lot of thought has actually gone into, you know, how do you develop business models that enable organizations to generate new revenue streams without compromising the existing business models? Okay. We also had the North American uh, a consultation on the open business models. And the, result, the resultant document is that open business model you see on the table. It's openly licensed. It's in, designed and intended to work as a cafeteria model because contexts differ at different institutions. It's about picking those parts of the business model that would work for your institutions if you're interested in sort of the business side of this operation. We welcome the philanthropic you know, social justice component as well. But it's a powerful example of how open uh, can serve both uh, models, right? It's not mutually exclusive. So that is uh, around the business model side of things. The fourth meeting of OERU partners, which also was uh, planned to coincide with the previous ICDE International World Conference, was hosted by Northwest University in Van der Bell Park in South Africa. Uh, the key decisions that were taken there after all our discussions and consultations, the uh, guidelines for credit transfer and credit accumulation for OERU were approved unanimously at the meeting. And, you know, with thanks to Mark, I, I remember, uh, Mark, your work in ensuring <laughs> that that group approved <laughs> those guidelines. Um, but it's a solid document. It is a very, very solid document. And if your institutions have questions about how this might work in your own institutions, read the guidelines. And, and you will see that it is designed in such a way that it will operate within existing institutional policies of the majority of institutions around the world. Um, we then, I mean, we also agreed we, we need to get a first year of study, and that was the David Porter challenge. I mean, David's not here, uh, but he said you've got to get product out there, and this is where the, we, the concept of minimum viable product came about, and, and, and minimum viable product for us is not the product that has all the bells and whistles and all the features. It's the minimum set of uh, functionality that we require in order to offer open online courses that lead to exit qualifications. And that's what we agreed to, and then we targeted all our initiatives in terms of course assembly around that first year of study. Uh, and, and as we do every year, we recalibrated the, you know, the Evergreen Strategic Plan uh, the third meeting of chief executive officers, uh, a strong recommendation from the CEOs for the distribution of the open business model, which we, of course, did, uh, and have had positive feedback from the vice chancellors on the open business model. And again, a strong endorsement from the CEOs that we've got to get this first year of study out of the door. Oh, I... 
that is where this the cert he was first proposed by clive at the south african meeting so clive because we we, we, were, we were trying to find a first year exit credential and clive put his head on the block and said well he will ask his university to consider implementing a certificate certificate in higher education um, and then later, um, Thompson Rivers University uh, put forward the Certificate of General Studies. The fifth meeting of OERU Partners was hosted in the beautiful Inverness uh, uh, by the University of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, again, uh, you can see reaffirming the launch of the OERU first year of study. Uh, we had made some progress. Uh, our Targets were, I, I, I suspect, a tad over-ambitious because I believe we were going to launch in March of this year. Uh, and then when it got to March this year, we realized, well, we didn't have all the bits and pieces in place for all this credit transfer and signing of contracts and, you know, uh, one or two courses still needed to be finished. So we focused our energies on getting those bits and pieces done. Uh, but at this meeting, at least we, we had you know, a solid confirmation of what the two exit awards would be uh, for this first year of study. Right. And I really welcomed this decision from the CEOs. Uh, the launch of the first year of study pursuing conservative but realistic targets. Um, and I think that is particularly important for our incremental design model. We need to get this right. We need to generate the data. There are so many facets of this model we don't know. Um, and, and, and taking a phased approach in moving this forward, I think, is in the interest of all our partners and all our learners as, as we move forward. But that will be an item for discussion you know, at, at the meeting as well in terms of how we phase uh, the launch of this program. The other decision uh, that we took uh, was to develop the Learning in a Digital Age course. So this is a course which is really a course about learning on the internet. Uh, it, it, every learner who embarks on tertiary study today would benefit from a, a you know, a, a course like this. I'm not going to say that every faculty member that teaches in higher education would also benefit from a course like this uh, because it is, there's an interesting um, dynamic uh, in, in, in this space. But one of the decisions we took was that we would try and implement learning in a digital age as an open boundary course, uh, which means that one or more institutions simultaneously teach the course uh, both to OERU learners and lo uh, learners locally. And I'm pleased to say that we have made progress in the survey that we had. Mark, I believe that you're in a very strong position to be able to recognize uh, credit transfer for the Learning in a Digital Age course. So perfect. So that, that means we will be able to achieve this open boundary objective, um, you know, where you've got two or more partners. Uh, you know, utilizing the same course, so to speak. Um, so there's been good progress on that front. So let, let me leave that there and open the floor for discussion. Do you have any questions? Any comments? Rory, you're looking as if you're wanting to say something. No. You're just looking. Any comments? Any questions? Concerns? Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment um, with regard to the uh, graduate um, of, from Thompson Rivers University that, that Wayne spoke about in his introduction. I think one of the things about OERU uh, is that we have often learnt by doing. And even though that one um, student, uh, you know, took a course from the regional relations course through Southern Queensland and was assessed by Southern Queensland, there was then the process of working with Thompson Rivers 
to have that um, formally recognized as part of the qualification of that student. And it wasn't an easy process. Um, and it took us a bit of back and forth to figure it through. And I think that we still have not completely mastered that, but it was one small step along the way towards achieving the overall objectives of, of OARU, which is you know strong credit transfers across all of our partners. And I just wanted to really just say that I think we often learn by doing and trialing. Thanks. It's a very uh, relevant co uh, comment. I, um, that experience was quite significant in, in, in informing the, develop uh, the development of the OVRU credit transfer guidelines. Um, because I think in, in the early stages, we over anticipated the ease with which um, you know, sort of this credit transfer recognition was going to take place. Um, notwithstanding the fact that our institutions have very strong um, uh, recognition of prior learning and uh, uh, you know, PLA in, you know, in Canada, it's not that straightforward um, because there are all sorts of issues that come into it. For example, uh, in, the, in the case of PLA, you've got to have mechanisms to assess the qualifications of the assessor, for example. Um, and that is a, a bit of an administration that I think is best avoided in the early phases of an OERU, for example. So we, we downscale that, that model as, as, as a mechanism you know, for credit transfer and, and really just work with transfer of transcript credit for MVP, which is easier to implement uh, in this context. Mark, you're looking as if you sure. wanting to offer words of wisdom and advice. Uh. I don't know that any wisdom will come out of this, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, no, I, I just to, to second what, what David was saying, uh, it's, it's really been, uh, a lot of it's been the process rather than the, the product that's been of most use to us, uh, you know, at learning how to work with others and, and then realizing um, that despite the fact that we've joined the OERU, that, that we are fairly rigid when it comes to our processes and our, and our uh, ability to, to truly be open. And so I, I think, that work, in our case, we collaborated quite a bit with UNISA and learned quite a lot about how to, uh, how to restructure or, or be open in our structure so that we could allow for this flow of, of course curriculum and ideas and content to, to, to really occur. So that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. No, thanks, uh, Mark. That's... And also how not to do things, eh? Ah, <laughs> oh, Brenda. Just uh, with reference to PLAR, so I'm not sure if a lot of the other institutions here are familiar with that concept, but it's a very big part of what we do at TRU. It's a very, very, we have a whole division that uh, looks after that, and it's, it's, it might seem an onerous process, Wayne, but it actually isn't. I mean, from our point of view as, as the institution that would be credentialing, uh, a, you know, a suite of courses coming in, if a course is not it's not transcriptable, in other words. If, if an institution, a student takes a course, which, which, and they come to us and say, we want the certificate in general studies, we're bringing in 30 credits, uh, six of which are TRU credits, which that satisfies our residential component. And then some of those credits coming in need to be plarred, per se. We have subject matter experts in place already. I mean, we're quite familiar with the process already. So it's not you know, I don't want it to be seen as a, as a stumbling block because I think it's just part of that whole assessment choice that we might have, right? It's actually, it's, it's uh, an easy, quite an easy thing. If it's coming in as a transcript and we know the course, we've already done the back end articulation and transfer. Um, and I think working with Quantlin, we can probably make sure we don't have to duplicate. I mean, so that if, if it's a course that Quantlin has assessed and said we recognize that, then we're going to recognize it. You know, it's, it's a seamless, because we're already part of the BCAT yeah, yeah. system. So we already articulate each other's courses and we articulate all courses within the universities of British Columbia to Alberta and almost all of Canada now. So what we're doing is we're creating actually this incredible database for international transfer. That's where we see this scaling up to a really effective, and that will benefit students and all institutions worldwide. Right, so you know, while PLAR can seem to be a stumbling block, it actually isn't. It's 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 definitely manageable. 
from from as the person who has to graduate those students, I we do PLAR all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, those are very important points, um, and I think my reference was more to the, the side of the institution doing the assessment and the extra admin on their side. Mm -hmm. um, that you know that comes with the model. Evan, were you wanting to say something? Oh, okay. Gail. As an instructional designer, my uh, input has mainly been in the area of developing some of the courses that we do have. And so my uh, hope, I, I'd like to do a bit of uh, brainstorming around how do we keep the product coming? So I, I'm beyond the certificate already because we've got courses to launch a certificate but my concern is I want to hear a degree at some point I want the student to be able to get a degree a, a general studies degree one certificate is okay but I think at this meeting I'd like to see us do a lot of planning because I know how long it takes for the product to come it took us so long to even get enough for a certificate I'd like to see us brainstorm and plan. How are we going to keep that product coming? More courses, more courses, so that we're ahead of the game with what's next after the certificate. Thanks, Gail. Yes, that's an important discussion that's on the agenda. I wonder if I, I I'd like to ask Sean just to tell us a little bit about how the Sailor Academy works around this whole piece of you know, awarding credit, because the Sailor Academy is a, a non-profit like ourselves, it's a foundation. They're not a teaching institution, right? Um, they're not an accredited institution. And I think it's worthwhile just having, because I'm not sure that everyone here actually knows how the credit piece works at, uh, at the Sailor Foundation. So I'm going to impose on Sean just to give us a brief summary. All right, thank you, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh... I get to answer these sorts of questions by email and social media and chat all the time anyway, so I'll see if I can translate that to a slightly different audience. Um, very, very brief background. I mean, we started credit uh, maybe back late 2011 or late 2012. Um, um, we've since progressed to the point where we can connect students to up to 91 credits across uh, 31 different courses. And uh, we have some more in the works right now, and then we have uh, courses that are getting reevaluated and so on and so forth. So essentially, you know, having built these kind of full length but self paced courses, we put them through a review by one of two organizations, the American Council on Education, ACE, or National College Credit Recommendation Service, which I think is based, uh, is operated under the SUNY Board of Regents, New York State University. Um, and so the courses are evaluated by one or both of those organizations. They're then recommended by those organizations as worth a certain number of credits, typically three. Um, we have one that went for one credit, one that went for two, uh, a calculus course that went for four. And these are um, a few business courses, a couple computer science courses, uh, and, and more across different, different topics. So what happens is a student takes that course, takes then a proctored exam. Uh, the student then earns a transcript either from Sailor or uh, issued by ACE that carries that recommendation. And then it's up to a college or university to respond to that recommendation by granting credit. And we work directly with about a couple dozen colleges and universities, uh, including uh, one in New Jersey that is represented here today, Thomas Edison. Um, and those colleges and universities guarantee credits. We have, you know, sort of articulation agreements to uh, take some of the burden off the student and make it a little more clear because it's already this strange thing. You know, you have this handoff where Sailor Academy, you know, students might be coming to us uh, like we're the first ones they meet but we're sort of negotiating between the student and that student's university 
whoever will be issuing the creditor degree. And then we have this ACE and NCCRS is in there somewhere and, and students can get a bit confused about that. So I guess long story short, it's, it's credit by examination mediated by these organizations who are doing the evaluation and recommendation. And then part of what Sailor's really trying to do in addition to providing the course is create those agreements with colleges and universities to make it as direct and obvious and pain-free as possible for the students. And both ACE and NCRCRS have much broader networks of schools that will consider the recommendations. So that's you know a, a thing that is sometimes difficult explaining to students. Uh, first, that Sailor is not issuing the credit. Um, ourselves, we're not accredited. Uh, and then second, that you know you have this this large group of schools that will consider credit, and then you have a smaller group of partner schools where we can do a better job of guaranteeing credit and making really clear what you can get credit for, what you can't, uh, making clear you should talk to advisors and mentors at the school to see what fits in your degree program. Yeah, it would be good. Just a mark and follow up as well as one of the organizations that works closely with um, the Sailor Academy. But this, in addition to that, I'd be curious to know, on, you know how many colleges in the U.S. would typically accept ACE credit? And I'm also interested to know if there are any institutions that recognize a Sailor Proctored exam for transfer credit. Oh, well, well, well for credit, not transfer, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Wayne. Um, so uh, there are about uh, 2,000 institutions in the United States, uh, both two and four year, that will accept uh, many, if not all, of ACE's recommendations, and a slightly smaller number that will accept the NCCRS recommendations. That's the other national organization that does these reviews. Um, we ourselves have, have reviewed a, a number of the courses uh, that Sailor has created uh, d directly. And uh, so, so at Thomas Edison, we accept, I think, all of Sailor's courses for credit. Uh, in fact, the, the courses actually go beyond, in many cases, what our courses would do. And so one nice thing about that for, for the folks here at OERU is that you can uh, choose from quite a lot of material to, you know, for your own students. Um, but we actually have a, an entire associate's degree, which is a two-year degree uh, in business administration that consists uh, just about entirely of sailor courses and a couple of our assessments added on. And so we've had about, I think it's 200 students now who are um, enrolled or have actually completed that associate's degree. That's a, a partnership. Uh, the open course ASBA is what we call it. At Thomas Edison, that's entirely through our work collaborating with the Sailor Academy. And then, of course, the other advantage is with regards to Sailor is that there will be more international pathways for OERU partners who are assessing Sailor courses that aren't in the U.S. So, which I think will be you know, a bit of value add to the Sailor network. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add to that, we've already done that quite a bit. At TRU, I've assessed courses that uh, uh, through the ACE um, review process. Um, of course, what makes it easier is if a student has a letter of permission before they even attempt to take one of those courses, and that's not always there. But coming from the, the back end, we can plar them in. So that's that's one of the mechanisms we we were already doing that. TRU. Yeah. Thanks, Brenda. Yeah. Right. In, any other questions? Comments, contributions? As you can see, the OERU moves forward at academic speed. <laughs> <laughs> some of the? Working groups that exist. Yes, so um, Gail has asked a question to talk about some of the working groups. Um, I won't talk too much now about the working groups because we are, we're going to have a, a, a good discussion around what is the optimal structure for the OERU given our current uh, state and where, where, where we're aiming to be? I mean, for example, the discussion around, well, developing product. I mean, I think there needs to be another robust discussion around, well, should we be developing for second and third year or should we be focusing on having an outstanding first year of study? I mean, I think there needs to be a robust discussion within the group you know, around that for, you know, the next phase of our journey. Um, but, you know, those are all parts of the discussion. 
uh, I mean, there are some working groups whose work has been completed, right? Because just by the nature of, you know, the work has been done. Um, so those groups don't need to exist anymore. Um, there are other groups that would need to continue. For example, the Standing Committee on Credit Transfer. Um, that's a kind of thing that will need to be the, you know, forever type of thing because that's kind of what we do at the OERU, right? Um, the other big challenge that we've got around working groups is as this organization is scaling, uh, we need to rationalize. We've got too many groups. Um, so, you know, th these are the kinds of things that we, we, we're going to have to have a conversation about and think about the best way forward. I'm not sure if that really, is, does that address your, your question, Gail? Yeah, and I'm keen on the marketing part. Okay. Yeah, um, we are very excited with this meeting. We've actually got a group of marketing professionals here at this meeting. Uh, I'm not sure if I can mention this publicly, but I am totally useless at marketing. <laughs> And uh, my partner on the, the regional marketing group, David Bull, also has absolutely no experience in marketing. <laughs> and that's why we've been struggling. But, um, but to be fair, I mean, it's hard to market something we haven't got product. I know certain countries do it very well. But, um, <laughs> you know, we haven't done a good job of it. Um, on that on that note of marketing, I think one of the the really big challenges that we have as a network is getting out the the very authentic message of what we are doing. And this year, I've had a, a number of discussions with with my senior managers, at least, uh, where you look at things like the Australian Higher Education Supplement and those sorts of things. And there are universities that have got the big headlines around: we are helping student equity. We are promoting equality and a lot of the processes that they're actually using are completely unsustainable. Things like um, we, we have universities that have said, well, we've, we've struck a deal with the Wileys and the Pearsons of the world so that all of our first year students have their textbooks purchased for them. Um, and that completely unsustainable, but it's framed in that we're very strong on social justice and this is what we're doing. And then I look at the work that we're doing in the OERU and I think, well, what you're doing by purchasing textbooks for your first year students pales in comparison. And I think that, that trying to get that authentic message out and grabbing awareness is going to be absolutely critical. But like you and David, I have absolutely no skills in this area. So I'd be very keen to, to hear from others. Yeah. Any comments from the floor? David. Just gonna squeeze through here. Thanks. So everyone I speak to about OERU says, what you're trying to do is like really hard. Like everyone recognizes that this is really, really hard. And so one of the things I think it needs is a whole series of compelling stories around the marketing piece, what Adrian was just talking about. And those little YouTube videos, those little 30 second YouTube videos that were put up originally were, did a really good job, in my view, of sort of selling the sizzle, right? So now we're into this kind of the beef cycle now. We've got to actually get something on the table and so getting a similar set of really compelling good stories out there about what a first year of study via OERU could do for you from a student's perspective would be a really important piece of the messaging. Um, I mean, the people we have to sell this to often are people in institutions who are like, what's in it for us? Like, where's the revenue stream? Like, that kind of stuff is really hard to defense. Like, I go at this openly all the time and say, this is part of your social service mission, period. This is not about revenue generation. It might be downstream, and it might be for select institutions like Mark's, which has a great business model associated with this, but that business model doesn't work for every institution. 
So we have to really get the story straight going forward. And if I were to encourage you to do anything coming out of this meeting, it would be getting those compelling stories written from a student perspective and building a marketing campaign around that. Solid advice, David, thank you. Comments? Kevin? Yeah, I think something else that we th possibly to keep in mind mm -hmm. is that there are multiple models in which students and other users can engage with the courses and the programs that we have at OERU. We have an entity at, at, at our university called uh, TRU World, which is quite actively engaged globally in providing education, particularly in, in China and, and the Far East, a uh, very successful operation. And a number of times you had discussions, they see many possible uses for these courses. I kind of think of these courses as tofu. It's, you can chop it and cut it and mix it in different ways and use them in different contexts, and they'll take on the flavor of the context that we put them in. So, for instance, uh, they're exploring working with several open universities in China and seeing how they could be um, delivered um, with, with uh, local facilitators in various other universities for, to provide a first year of, uh, of an international uh, um, uh, diploma certificate which then opens a gateway to studying at our or other universities and that's one of a number of options that we've thought about so there are bigger pictures uh, options there's another uh, negotiation going on right now with a very large uh, franchise of, of uh, language schools which would like to use them um, in some kind of a structured way in partnership with our university uh, to help their students also uh, actually use them to gain actual, to apply their language skills to academic content uh, in the process, uh, uh, possibly build up some early credit for carrying on at, at, at a university and they've already gotten to know ours a little bit. So, um, so there's, there's multiple models beyond uh, just putting the courses out there and marketing to students sort of en masse. I mean, there's a whole world out there. That's a pretty broad marketing uh, field but if we start thinking about what are some of the strategic uh, uh, um, focal points that we could take with the OERU, even if we find several large core clients, it could be a whole country. Um, so um, with, with, with that's struggling with uh, development of higher education. So I think there's lots of different ways to take this and to think about marketing and whom we are marketing to. We're really liking the, uh, the phrase, hope marketing. <laughs> the tofu marketing model. <laughs> Professor McGreal. Um, Wayne, didn't we receive money from Hewlett for marketing? We spent it. And we've spent it. Yeah. And we, no, no, we, we do have, we, we have developed, uh, we've developed a bunch of marketing collateral and that was what, what that project was for. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, an, there's a student rec card uh, that institutions are able to use to send the word out. There are uh, student videos uh, that you know, explain the concept. They have been designed and developed uh, with the intention for institutions to be able to brand them. I mean, we can, the examples on the course website, um, where institutions have actually customized the student video. So we have a, a rather quaint Australian accent version, uh, which is a, a tad better than the New Zealand mm -hmm. one, I believe. Um, <laughs> 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 um, and, and, and these bits of collateral that we've got uh, are open, of course openly licensed, this is what we do, but institutions can brand th that collateral themselves with their own visual identity and you know, but you know marketing is an interesting area, people don't like using other people's copy, it's not the tradition in the marketing space or is it? But the, the others, the, does it answer your question, Rory? Oh, yeah. Look, the other things that we need to do in addition to that, what I should mention on the back end, and we, we will possibly look at some of this detail when we look at our technology infrastructure. On the back end, we, we're using a, a, a piece of marketing automation software. Uh, it's called Mautic. And what the marketing automation software's primary purpose is, is to automate 
the email instructions for learners who want to receive email instructions for the course materials. So we set up our, uh, our course instructions in advance, right? You know, work through session one and hope you have a nice day. And then, you know, when it comes to session two, they'll get another email. And the two ways you can study at, at the OERU, either cohort-based, so there's a start date and an end date, or entirely open uh, independent study. You start at any time, you finish at any time. And we set up these campaigns, they're either based on the dates, right, on the 9th of September, or, well, that's gone already, but on you know, the 15th of October, get email, email for session one, right? On the 30th of October, get the email for session two. But the exciting point or, or the interesting point about this is at the point, because we will know when learners are ready for assessment, we can inject marketing collateral from our partner institutions who offer assessment services for those particular courses to those learners. And that's a significant advantage uh, of you know, being part of the membership for institutions that are intending uh, to generate revenue uh, from this. And that's one of the things that the marketing group is going to be thinking about is, you know, how, how, how do we target uh, the markets? We've got lead generation, for example, on all our sites. So anybody who's interested in the OERU, you know, registers an email, we've got the lead generation. They are, are assigned to particular campaigns uh, within the Mautic engine. Uh, the side comment, of course, is that anybody that doesn't use marketing automation on the campus and actually wants to use an open source tool, we publish recipes for how to set up those tools yourself. Um, so that's just a bit of background information that's worth knowing. The other piece in the conversation, we've had a couple, uh, well, we've had a, uh, one or two preparatory meetings with the marketing group and well, I mean, we've been quite open and candid about this. I mean, our institutions do compete against each other, right? And we need to recognize that. I mean, the work that we're doing around OERU marketing is not intended uh, to, you know, harmonize, you know, marketing. It's, it's, we recognize the independence and autonomy of our marketing teams. But it's kind of the competition model. I think there are things within the OERU space that is serving a differentiated market where it makes sense to do some things together so that our individual institutions can compete better. So, I mean, I think we need to get that out there as part of the conversation, right? Um, because that's the real world, right? Yeah. Yep. There's a question from Paul West. Thank you. Or, or a point, a comment from Paul West. Um, so Paul West, is, uh, who's, who's a virtual participant, um, has um, submitted a point that um, he's provided a link to a government, uh, South African government document, which I think is a national policy with which he suggests the OERU could cooperate and perhaps use a, I think he's saying as a model for, for um, these sort of agreements with other, with other national uh, policy, or to, yep. to, to align with other national policies in other countries. Hi, Paul. Uh, glad you could join us. It must be getting very late for you uh, if you uh, are in the UK at the moment. But thanks for that link and that reference. We will uh, document it in the report and certainly take a close look at your recommendation. Thank you for that. Right. Any other comments? Thoughts from our observer institutions? I, I'd be curious to know what... You know, what does this look like to you as you being here as your first meeting? It's still early days, right? But I'm curious. It's valuable information for us. Uh, yeah, again, James, I work with a, a, a public institution at Community College in California. We're a very large uh, system and uh, highly regulated. A lot of this conversation feels very familiar, in fact, uh, when we try to uh, uh, make arrangements with uh, amongst the 114 California community colleges to uh, quote unquote, seamlessly permit students to transfer credits amongst institutions. It's challenging. Uh, so it, it just feels familiar and I'm glad an awful lot of, I'm glad many years of work have been done before I got in the room. <laughs> Um, I'm going to take this um, from a library perspective. We're engaged in open access publishing, and so some of this um, 
is reminiscent of, or reminds me of the conversations we're having with faculty in educating them on the um, various business models. So whether it's open access out of your institution, whether it's um, using an open access model with publishing journals uh, that are in a private sector um, business model. I, I feel with the OERU, it's, it's, it's similar. The conversations are, are similar in that a large part of it is informing your, your institution and engaging your faculty and administration in the various models to the point uh, earlier, you know, buying textbooks and providing them to students through the big publishers uh, is seen as OE, OER in some way. Um, so again, it's, it, I think we need to make sure people are aware of the various uh, models and then at some level, um, marketing and educating accordingly but at our school right now we are in the process of open open access journals publishing open access journals uh, and informing our faculty what does that mean can you still publish in Elsevier can you do this can you do that I feel this is very similar the conversations we're having but also letting people sort of make the choices that are applicable to their environments and also to their own personal um, careers and their well-being in some way. Yeah. And thank you for that. I mean, there are clearly strong parallels between sort of the open access experience and OER. Sadly, I don't think there's enough sharing of experiences between those two Absolutely. groups. And I think an area we can improve. Yep. I just want to echo your reflection in response to Sandy's comments. We also have a uh, an open access and open learning librarian who's very, very uh, Keen and enthusiastic, and 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 yeah, and as as we work through the next few days and talk about um, um, how OERU processes start flowing through our institutions, I think we have to have those engages conversations within our institutions, with among particularly among the advocates, among the very best who are those from the library, because you're feeling the heat more than anybody in terms of the cost of all the journals and databases and so on, right? So, um, and also in terms of learner support, um, why not try to uh, make more um, uh, resources, open education resources available through the university to our students as learning uh, supports and so on. So I think there's a lot of work to be done there. We focus mostly on courses up till now. But uh, the local resources as well is something that we could really start growing. And I could see possibly some kind of a collaboration among the librarians of our partners to help move that idea forward as well, too. Thanks very much, Irwin. Nodding in agreement. Ah, Adrian. Right, I'm going to take this as the last comment before we uh, break for tea. I just I want to put one or two things out. About the meeting side, but thank you, Adrian. No. I just wanted to, um, to respond as well and build on your comment about the, the learner support. Um, one of the things that we're still in very early days with um, at USQ is having um, student learning resources designed by students for students. So, you know, not a new concept by any by any uh, stretch of the imagination, and then openly licensing those. And I think that uh, perhaps once we get to the point where we've got a, a really good critical mass of OERU students, uh, maybe that's the point where we can either ask those students to help to build those resources, or maybe within certain courses, learning in a digital age, for example, we could actually have pieces of assessment where students design things for the OERU that is authentic assessment. Excellent suggestions, and the whole sort of support piece is high on this agenda of the 2017 meetings, uh, uh, there's some interesting developments around peer-to-peer -peer U that have a, a global program running uh, learning circles where they have relationships with public libraries that provide support for open online courses. And so there, there are interesting synergies for how we could collaborate with peer-to-peer -peer U, in, for example, in, in, as one of the mechanisms for improving support. So that'll be a conversation. I'm hoping that the folk from peer to peer U will be joining us and we'll see uh, uh, how they'll be joining us. So basically what I want to do now is just point out one or two things on the, uh, the agenda, the meeting site. Uh, so let me just share the screen here again. 
Is it going to cause problems for you? I'll share the screen name. Right. It should be coming through now. Yeah. So basically, just what I uh, what I wanted to point out on the meeting site, if you the easiest way to navigate the meeting site, this might not be immediately obvious if you're visiting the site for the first time. Um, under the partners meeting, there's a schedule summary which kind of gives a high level uh, overview of what's happening on each day uh, for each of the sessions. And then you can actually drill down into the detailed sessions uh, in terms of how that works. Um, and the detailed sessions for each day are, are, are provided as a sublink there. And if you, you know, just open up that menu bar, you'll get the, the individual you know, sessions. Uh, the, or the agenda for each of those sessions and all the links that we use for our collaboration documents. When, when we break out into small groups, we actually record our recommendations and you know, that sort of thing. So we've got a permanent record of it. All the links to those documents are provided in the agenda. So if you're looking where to record things, they've all been set up in advance and there are a couple of sort of uh, prompting questions to get the discussions going. Uh, but as an open you know, consultation, you will guide those discussions and how, how you record that. Also want to point out that there are links for each of the virtual participant groups uh, who also, if they uh, are attending, break out and have the, you know, the discussion virtually in the documents, which we integrate back into the meeting and also in, in the reporting in terms of moving forward. So that's in terms of the links. The other uh, bit of information I need, it's just, so how the process works, I just want to see if I've got an example. Yeah, there's an example link. So the other thing that is important with OERU meetings, um, the outputs of this meeting, right, the recommendations get tabled at the meeting of chief executive officers on Monday, okay? So in addition to the recommendation proposals that we actually propose in the small breakout groups, there may be certain issues that arise that are important and need attention, right? And those issues need to be brought to the attention of the meeting of the CEOs. There's a, a document called issues for CEOs. So if in you know, one of your breakout discussions, there's an issue that's been raised, please record it on the issues for CEOs document. So what I've done is in each of the breakout documents, I've actually included a hot link to the issues for CEOs, um, um, you know, documents. So it is there. So if, you know, when you're discussing something, there's an important issue that is, you know, comes up, please record it there. Because then what we do at the end of today and tomorrow, we, we go through those issues uh, in, in terms of what we're going to put forward at the CEO's meeting. The other thing I should just point out is on the collaboration documents, the, it's password protected. Um, and that's just to help us uh, mitigate against the sale of UGG boots. Um, but the, the password, all lowercase, is OER, and I've written it here on the flip chart, OER, numeral for all, OER for all, Toronto lowercase. And that should get you in. Okay. So thank you very much. Let's break for tea. And we'll be back. We'll reconvene at what time is that? We, uh, quarter past 11. We reconvene at 11.15. Uh, it's no tea. <laughs>